Hey, hi, hello, welcome to episode, I think this is 49 of Trail Society brought to you by our friends over at Free Trail. I'm Corinne Malcolm and I copy and paste our intro every time and it is definitely episode 49. <laughs> and I'm Keely Henninger. And our very own Hilly Goat Allen is currently in Kansas getting ready for the Unbound Gravel 200 mile bike race this weekend and she tried desperately to get on this phone call with us but um you know what you bring a big event to a tiny town and you blow out the cell towers pretty fast Mm -hmm. it's like auburn or forest hill same thing happens in western states you can't text anyone from forest hill during or from the track during gold oh gosh yeah that reminds me of my college days when you'd have like a big penn state tailgate and your cell wouldn't work for the whole day because it's just so many people (laughs) yep a hundred percent. Same. I grew up in a tiny town in Northern Wisconsin. You bring the American Berkabiner there every February, the biggest North American ski race. And uh, yeah, cell, cell towers don't work anymore because there's just too many humans. Actually, they've started to bring in cell boosters for that reason. I don't think that's mm-hmm. happening in Emporia, Kansas this weekend though. Um, Keely, you are not at home and you're not in Tahoe. So where the heck are you? I know this is my last travel outing before Western States. So then I get to chill for a bit, but I'm currently in Denver, Colorado at the ACSM conference. So American College of Sports Medicine. It's a, it's been a really fun conference so far. Um, I haven't presented yet. Like we have our poster session on Friday. Um, me and a couple other of Kelly Pritchett's students actually are also presenting. Um, but we're in a section over in the convention center, basically all about low energy availability. So That's I'm really so excited cool. to also talk with the other scientists in this space. Um, and so far I've already been to like a thematic and a session focused on menstruation. Um, definitely have seen some really cool studies come out of Australia Institute for sport, um, and out of the WUSI Alliance. So out of Stanford and the female athlete program. Um, but I have also seen some, you know, some studies that still kind of lack a little bit of hormonal like tracking in order to actually identify the menstrual cycle phase. So, you know, I think it's cool that it's getting its own section and that there's a ton of research in it now. So that only means it's going to continue to get better and the research will only be more robust. And so I think overall it's very exciting. And then, um, actually like an hour or two hours ago before I taught my class, I got back from the Wusai update. Um, I had to miss the last half of it, but I got the first couple speakers in, um, and they're doing a lot around big data and how to optimize like data with athlete recovery and predictive modeling for like exoskeletons and movement and all sorts of stuff. And so, you know, they do, are, they are doing the female athlete program. Um, that is obviously a very big, you know, yeah, milestone or, part or of the bucket Boston, of work for them. Boston mm-hmm. group too, right? Yep. Yeah. With Dr. Catherine Ackerman. Um, but a lot of she's the like, a genius. Sci, yeah, she's awesome. She, she introed it all. And she basically, she said something along the lines of, uh, last year they gave me the full stage with my whole, like, you know, crew on female athletes this year, I guess I'll let the men talk. <laughs> and so then the men were discussing all their progress projects, which are also really cool. And also under that Alliance, because the Alliance obviously has a multifaceted goal around human performance, not just female athletes, but again, a couple other like buckets too. And so that was a really cool one. And then one thing I'm excited for, um, for tomorrow is a whole symposium on return to sport postpartum. Sick. Yeah. So So. cool because doing, it turns out doing research on pregnant women is a big hangup for a lot of groups, even in the medical field. I was actually talking to Laudia Albertson, Mm -hmm. Junkins about this recently. She works um, kind of in the medical uh, big data. She's a data scientist um, in the pharmaceutical space. And yeah, they'll, they'll have um, projects turned down because they don't, they don't want to like the, the project lead or the project they'll, they'll get turned down for funding um, Mm. when it like involves pregnant individuals, which is like, you're like pregnant individuals get sick, sick individuals get pregnant, pregnant individuals do sports. Yeah. Like it's pregnant individuals. I get it. Like it's, I get, I get the restrictions, I guess, because there's safety. There's safety. When they did, for, when they did first do studies on pregnant women, they actually like didn't do their due diligence and they gave them supplements that did result in birth defects. So I feel like they're kind of in a weird place now where they're like, ah, we can't study them. <laughs> but yeah. I think we need to get to a happy medium where we're doing our due diligence. We're doing studies that are not going to be harming the women so that we actually can learn about them. Yeah, particularly like there's studies like I think the the space that I was talking to Lottie about was had to do with like nausea 
in mm. pregnant women. And it's like nausea is a subjective thing akin to pain. And so it's like, we're not going to, there's like, there's like limited harm and stuff like that. So it's just like, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see where some of that space goes, but it's cool mm-hmm. to see it happening. And when I think big data, I think we're both wearing aura rings. Um, they work in partners with like natural cycles. I remember reading mm-hmm. some of the early aura ring UC Davis and maybe UCLA studies on like, they found that they could detect pregnancy like a week before a normal take on pregnancy test using mm. or ring like temperature readings and some other, like some yeah. other like staging metrics. So I think it's super I'm cool. Really. I think that there's some really not, there's some minimally invasive or non-invasive ways to track some of this that I think mm-hmm. doesn't rely completely on subjective feedback or um just humans were bad at reporting things because we're humans Mm -hmm. it's like dietary recall we're like really bad at that um i don't remember what i did yesterday type of thing i didn't know that it was wednesday yesterday until like day like it took me like 24 hours to figure out what day i was in so it's like (laughs) things like that like really good wearables i think will be cool for some of this data Mm -hmm. collection involving menstruating individuals who have who where temperature can be a reflection of some of those hormonal mm-hmm. um, agree yeah stuff, which is super I cool. think yeah and I think it's a way to get away from the the studies that you know guess when the subject is in a certain phase of their cycle and so they bring them in but they bring them in three days late and then they get you know all of these measures and it's yeah. actually during their ovulation phase and they thought it was during this phase yeah it's like it's, no if we can actually monitor like you know, all of these different parameters real time by just gathering all of this big data around, you know, body temperature, metabolic rate, whatever it is, like we can start seeing those trends if we get enough data eventually and we won't have to guess. Yeah. Yeah. I cool. agree. This is the world's longest intro and that is okay because <laughs> you all are as nerdy as we are for the most part. So thanks for bearing with our non rant about female science. It's the science in the female space. Um, before we dive into kind of some short results and some news that actually kind of follows the same theme, which mm-hmm. will be, in- I'm interesting to like kind of hear your take on it because we actually haven't talked about it yet. Mm-hmm. So I'm like really curious in real time to kind of like pick your brain and see what's going on there. But first, we'd give a shout out to AG1. They've been with us since the beginning. Um, if you would like to try AG1, it's something that I've added to my daily routine. I don't, it's not a green drink. It's really a multivitamin. It's kind of that nutritional band aid, making sure that I'm completely covered when I'm traveling, when I'm ramping up my mileage to make sure that I am having, I'm getting all those micronutrients. And for me in particular, that mix of a probiotic and prebiotic, um, when it comes to like gut health for me personally and absorbing things like iron from my diet. Um, if you want to try AG1, you can go over to www.athleticgreens.com slash trail society. And there with your first purchase, you can get a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs. So again, go over to www.athleticgreens.com slash trail society and uh, purchasing there helps to support us. And we really appreciate it. And I think we have some quick hitting results. I did not go super deep on any of these, but I just wanted to pull out some things that really stood out to me and stood out to me predominantly in like the like, hell yeah, women space if that's cool with all of you listening. Mm -hmm. So the first one for me was Ruth Croft is back. She didn't really go anywhere, but she, Mm -hmm. since winning Western States last year, I feel like she took some time off. Mm -hmm. She kind of had an okay fall. I think she would agree with that. I don't want to put words in her mouth. She did not do Madeira this spring. It, It sounds like she had some, like some niggles, some health stuff, and was really just trying to get it dialed in and figured out. She ran the maxi race, the 43 kilometer there. It's a mystery course marathon. Like you literally find out the course, like the morning of it's, it's marked. It's not like a choose your own adventure, but you don't know what the course is until you literally are going to go run the race. Um, and it was super fast and furious. The podium was super tight on both the men's side and the women's side. Like the men's podium was like separated by two minutes. I think on the women's side, um, Anna, um, Annalisa Rosette won the race in 4.53 with Ruth finishing finishing less than a minute behind her in, uh, that should say four 4.54. Um, typos on my end are classic in this mm-hmm. results section. And then um, another woman ran out, ran out the podium with Anna Cecilia Tevano um, in 5.04. So really, like really, really tight racing. Cool to see Annalisa and Ruth just like totally throwing down. Um, they are both super stout athletes. So I think that was 
a good way for Ruth to kick off her campaign, I believe towards UTMB at the mm-hmm. end of August, early September. So yeah, that is super sick. Did you see the next, the next bit of results I pulled in was just the, the by UTMB race in South Africa. No. So it's over on the Western <laughs> Cape in a place called George. So not in Cape town. Um, and it's the, I think the only qualifier on the African continent, um, for UTMB. So it's kind of like, mm. you got to go to this one. They okay. had a 43 K that didn't qualify for OCC. It was just kind of a secondary race. They had a 60 K that qualifies for OCC, a hundred K race, and then a hundred mile race. And the hundred mile race, I think only had like 45 starters, four of whom were mm. women. Mm-hmm. And only two of those women finished because initially, like they only reported the men's podium for a long time on those won by Ryan Sands, I believe. And then I was like, where are the women? And then they only reported two women. And I was like, what is happening? And we'll mm-hmm. turn four started two finished. It sounds like an mm-hmm. absolutely brutal race, but in my mind, you know, UTMB has developed this new qualify like qualification system which is for everyone, right? Everyone has to collect stones for the lottery, but for elites, it's your only way into the race is via performing at one of these qualification races. And then you have races where like, you don't even have a podium finishing. And so I'm just mm-hmm. wondering, like, are they really setting themselves up for like a super good UTMB finale at the end of the summer? Like, I don't know, based on what we see kind of at like race after race right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, the races that they've chosen to be certain qualifiers, even ones that, you know, include top 10 to me are kind of question mark races. And yeah, I don't know. I think that they are going to end up having to change some of their policies if they want to make sure they're getting the most competitive field. But I also, you know, on the other, when the, when I think about it another way, I think it's really great that they're, you know, broadening the scope of UTMB to other countries and continents, but yeah, at the same time, it depends on what their goal is. Like they want to make it a really competitive finale. Then I think they might have to go about it a different way. Um, I think my biggest problem right now is that like, I've heard stories of some people getting in through the, the lottery and some people getting reached out to by UTMB in terms of elites. And then some people having to go race to get in. And I just feel like if they're, they're kind of blurring the lines between how to get in. I don't know if I like that. Yeah. I think it needs to be more cut and dry and straightforward. And this is a transition year, which Mm -hmm. does mean that like things could be a bit off this year, but I've told them point blank in a meeting, like in a meeting with UTMB, like with the race directors, with their social media team, with their um, like athlete manager. And I was like, if you guys have a question mark year in 2024 or 2023, that impacts who wants to do your race in 2024. Mm -hmm. If UTMB isn't going to be the most competitive race in the world, why would I come do it? Like, why would I put my eggs in that basket to risk not like getting to race the very best? So I think it's, it's an interesting conundrum. And maybe that just goes back to like, you should do the races that you really want to do and kind of like screw convention. But, um, i that like that case is being made more strongly when stuff like this is happening, I think in my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. totally. Like it's on my list for 2024, but it's like, I don't know, like maybe it won't be, maybe I'll be at run rabbit or something instead. <laughs> like who knows i mean that that in itself deserves its own episode <laughs> yeah run rabbit's a whole different story i mean run rabbit arguably is the best paying race in best trail and ultra in running, trail running out there like you could walk away with over 20 grand if you did the individual and team race yeah and, and you should do the team race just weekend, do it yeah right and nobody races it Yet, Mm -hmm. you know, we all go break our backs to get into Western States, which is basically negative $500. And then we break our backs to go get stones to get into UTMB that just now release a very small prize person. So just interesting, like the sport is evolving and I think it'll be interesting to see how prize persons start to change and evolve and and dictate where people go. Yeah. Yeah. And if it, if it does or not, and kind Mm of like Western States still is important, independent of that. Totally. Um, yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. And I, I should note for those of you that listen, I uh, got a newsletter today from UTMB and it said Western States by UTMB. And I was like, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I like, I've, I've since texted people on the board and they're like, excuse me. So it's either, it was either um, <laughs> sloppy or 
like sneaky and shitty, but it's in my mind, it looks like a copy and paste by the communications oh, okay. team of UTMB <laughs> and the Western States board does not sound super stoked on it. But I keep, people keep asking me like, did you, did Western States get bought by UTMB? And I was like, no, I don't like not, not like it's an independent nonprofit. Like it's mm-hmm. private. They're just, a, they're a partner in the world series. Um, and then I realized people are asking because like on the, like, graphic that was created by UTMB to present their 2023 calendar, it sure as heck says Western States endurance run by UTMB, but every single race is by UTMB after it. And I have to imagine Mm. like not probably not an intern, but someone made this graphic and just was lazy or didn't know Mm -hmm. because, and it wasn't, and someone, someone in the editing process missed that. And I was (laughs) like, I'm sorry, Craig, but this is why everyone (laughs) thinks that you guys got bought. Yeah. So, oh, man. Well, I'm glad you told them. That's that's news that literally happened today, June 1st. Wow. So I'm working on rectifying marketing as we speak. <laughs> um, two more quick results wow. things before some news. Um, the Capital Backyard Ultra happened in Virginia. Again, these backyard races are a four-mile loop that you run every hour on the hour until there's one person remaining. Well, until recently on the women's side, Courtney DeWalter was the person that had, had ever had run the most amount of yards for a woman. But Jennifer Russo, who I want to say is in their late, they're in their late forties. I could be wrong. She could be in her early fifties. I'm going to say late forties. And if she's older, extra kudos. Um, Someone, someone correct me and check me on this, but there's 57. 57. Okay. In my head, I had 47. So 57, super, super impressive. So it was down to Jennifer and one male athlete going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. She did not end up being the last person standing. The the gentleman that she was racing against won the event, but she ran 74 yards. So she ran for 74 hours, which is almost 300 miles. Like it's it's, it's on like, ultra it's, sign up. It says 308. 308. Oh, I wonder what their does, loop is. But... What their official loop is because it's it's four point something miles. Like, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, four point one six or something. So. so. Yeah. That it's could probably, be, that could get it over. <laughs> yeah. So 300 miles in 74 hours. Like that is Crazy. absolutely insane. So she didn't get the award, but if you're the, the second to last person standing, you are awarded the assist because mm. you can't set a record in these races without someone else pushing you. Mm-hmm. Right. Totally. Like the race is over when you're the last person standing. It's not like if you, you don't get to keep going until you tap mm-hmm. out when everyone else is right. tapped out and they could tap out after 30 yards, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, Really, really cool to see that. And then the other one just came up to me. I uh, came through via an athlete of mine who got beat by all these women um, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago at the Keys 100. The women went second, third, fourth, and fifth overall. Oof. A guy won and then second, third, fourth, and fifth went to women in the Keys 100, which is a 100 mile road race. Um, it preps a lot of people for Badwater 135, which is why the athlete um, mm-hmm. that I coach was there. He's prepping for bad, bad water 135 again this year. So went to keys to get his butt kicked and that also happened. So congratulations <laughs> to the women there though. That, that is in my mind, just super impressive and an indicator too, of like women being smart, women running well in the heat, women like managing the conditions, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So super impressive. Huge. Yeah, kudos. Wow. So news, we have one little news story, which mm-hmm. is themed closely to what we are going on about earlier in this. And that is the Lululemon launches their further project, um, including the announcement of um, bringing on 10 athlete ambassadors. Um, So essentially professional athletes for Lululemon, professional people really for Lululemon, because I feel like they do support them in many roles beyond being an athlete. But that included Camille Heron, Devin Yanko, Leah Yingling, and Stephanie Flippin. So huge news for North American women having four Americans brought on to this further project. The further project is going to culminate in a six-day, in quotes, first of its kind, ultra marathon for women that will be held on women on, on International Women's Day, March 8th of 2024, where some world record attempts will go down by the likes, I'm sure, of like Camille Heron, um, probably in a in a six-day feat. Other people might be trying to run you know, a hundred K or a hundred miles as fast as possible. Some people are just going to try to go further than they ever have gone before. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a super interesting idea. And part of me would have kind of maybe scoffed at it until I saw the people involved in it. Does that like, does that like ring true to you as well, Keely? 
Yeah, I think if I hadn't heard a lot of the personal anecdotes from some of the athletes before the launch, I would have been a little more critical of the launch and maybe, you know, didn't, wouldn't have thought as highly of it initially until doing more research into it. But yeah, hearing about the investment in women, especially around like the science where Mm -hmm. they brought on like Trent Stellingworth with Canadian Sport Institute to like actually conduct tests on these women to, you know, better understand their sweat rate, all of these things to like give them the full package along with like mental health professionals and physical therapists and all these things so that they actually can become, you know, the best athletes that they can be. I think it's really, really cool. And it took a lot of guts. I think a lot of brands love to say that they're supporting women. And I'm, I'm very, very impressed that Lulu actually put their money where their mouth was. Yeah. Like, it seems like part of me is like, Oh, this is splashy. This is marketing. I'm for actually, sure. fr- I'm friends with the VP of global marketing for Lululemon um, from when back in the day, Stevens, uh, the, the bike team that he raced for was sponsored by Lululemon. So I, I know a bunch of people that work there. I've worked in the white space lab myself before conducting research while in grad school, which is like, they're really cool lab in, in headquarters in Kitsilano. Um, but yeah, initially I was like, Ooh, this is kind of flashy. It's kind of marketing, but knowing that the Canadian sports Institute was involved, I believe Megan Roach and, um, I don't know if Emily Krauss is involved or not, but I think the, the faster program women's sports science stuff has really been tagged in there. So it feels like they're investing beyond like lip service by mm-hmm. like trying to go a lot further in, literally that no pun intended there further in like supporting the athlete. And I'm really excited about the possibility of some of the research collected during this project. I, part of me hopes it goes beyond the women that are specifically involved in the further project itself at the 10, the 10 ambassadors. Um, just because like when we talk about sample size and all these things, like when it comes to conducting research, particularly in exercise physiology, Um, sample size is oftentimes the thing that makes us go, well, like, Mm -hmm. you know, this isn't really significant because there's not enough power in the data because it's an N of two, or in this case, an Mm -hmm. N of 10, et cetera. So I am hopeful that the research powers that be are able to broaden out the data collected to make significant claims, hypotheses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or at the very least, they take some of their findings from their N of four or N of whatever and, you know, use those findings to fuel future studies or future ideas. So, yeah. So super curious to see what happens there. We don't know everything yet. I think there's still a bunch of stuff under um, embargo and under NDA. So we'll be curious to see that as it comes out. And then the other cool thing was that, um, that Lululemon has also partnered with the Trail Ahead podcast that's hosted by Faithy Briggs and Addie Thompson, um, who I think are going to take us on some like behind the scenes look of some of the things going on within the further project. Um, and supposedly they're going to drop a new podcast soon. I don't know if it's come out yet this week or not, but I'm hopeful that we'll hear more from them. And it's cool. Um, they really look at a lot of intersectional topics on their podcast. Um, if you haven't listened to it yet, please go do. They just launched, I think, their third season. Um, but again, that's the Trail Ahead podcast with Faith E. Briggs and Addie Thompson. Super cool to see them brought on to the project as well. Mm-hmm. Any kind of final thoughts on the further project for now? No, I'm excited to see what comes of it. Yeah, I think this could be like a nice precedent for other brands to kind of follow suit. Yeah, to actually invest mm-hmm. in their athletes. I've seen some of the contract stuff on their end via, or I guess stuff via a lawyer, via like no, no NDAs broken, et cetera. But I've, with the work that we do with the PTRA and we, when we talk about like um, athlete education and we're working on some educational material to bring to athletes and bring to brands, some of the stuff that I know was fought for and included within the Lululemon contracts will benefit all athletes, all female athletes, Mm. all future parents, um, via, you know, you're like via motherhood, via adoption, via, um, any of those things, uh, Mm -hmm. surrogacy, et cetera. Like there's some really interesting stuff coming out of the contracts that Mm -hmm. I'm aware of that I think will benefit all of us when it comes to future contract negotiations. So really really see big companies like stepping up in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess one final thought I just had is that I'm also like I commend them for not signing a single male. Yeah. Like yeah, it's they decided a that they're going to do this project. Yeah. 
pretty ballsy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it definitely is. Yeah. They have some male athletes on the track, but not within this project itself. Mm-hmm. So I think that's yeah. a cool precedent for them to mm-hmm. set. Very cool. Sweet. We commend you, Lululemon. You probably won't hear this, but we like you and we like your athletes. So we're here for this. <laughs> um, and for those of you who are wondering, where is Stephanie going? Where is Leah going? Where are Devin going? We now know. So there you go. <laughs> Before we jump into our meat and potatoes for the day, we have to give another shout out to the feed. I'm in love with the feed. I think I just sent in an order for um, what will make up my, I think my final race focused nutrition for Cascade Crest in July. And I am so freaking excited for it to get here. You obviously are prepping for Western States. Keely, I'm wondering on your end, what has what has arrived for you thus far as you prep for uh, for Western states and your nutrition strategy there, or just getting through this ACSM conference? Yeah, I got my shipment sent to Tahoe, and so it unfortunately arrived while I was gone here. So it arrived a couple of days ago. But basically, Jeff Stern is goal, eating everything. I know. I said, do not eat all of it. <laughs> um, but the goal is to almost like fuel the training. Um, yeah. So just tons of bars, tons of granola, some recovery mixes, coffee, you Heck know, yeah. all the things that are just important for, you know, running at altitude because I'm not from altitude. So the first couple of weeks are kind of rough yeah. and you're burning a lot more. At least I feel like I'm burning a lot more and, you know, we are burning more calories at, at altitude. And so just trying to stay on top of the nutrition because that can be kind of a, a black hole, if you will, uh, when you're at altitude. So thankful for the feed for that. Yeah. 100%. So if you would like to try products from the feed, again, it's your one-stop shop for all your sports nutrition recovery needs, um, including really cool water bottles that we have made with them. So again, you're going to go over to www.thefeed.com slash trail society. I actually noticed recently because I applied for the credit. If you go over to that, that link that we just said, www.thefeed.com slash trail society, you can get a $15 credit quarterly. I, without asking, had a $15 credit from our quarterly thing applied to this last, this last uh, order I sent in. So really, really cool. Again, that's $60 for the year given out $15 quarterly. So go get some, uh, free sports nutrition over there and try something new today and get the water bottle, <laughs> get the water bottle and show us your water bottle. Tag us. We have an Instagram account. We love social media. We're so good at it. We're doing an amazing job. We're trying really hard. So support us there with your water bottles. <laughs> okay. The meat and potatoes. I was really excited for this interview. And it's not just because I'm super close friends with Heidi Strickler. She literally lives a mile from me. I've been running her dog for her. as She's been struggling through a little bit of a running injury of her own. Um, but she's a brilliant, brilliant person. She's a registered sports dietitian a certified specialist in sports dietetics, a metabolic efficiency training specialist. She's got her master's in sports nutrition from the Liverpool John Moore's Moore's University in England. In her private practice, she specializes in endurance athletes, mountain athletes, female athletes, um, specifically working with athletes with low energy availability, red S and disordered eating. And her ultimate goal as a registered dietitian is to empower her clients and athletes to realize their greatest potential, achieve their goals, and thrive in both sport and life. Like she truly embodies this. The conversations I have had with her are absolutely amazing. She firmly believes that believes in and practices an all foods fit mentality and is extremely passionate about changing the harmful language, beliefs, and culture of sport as it pertains to body ideals and disordered eating practices. She's so brilliant. And we're gonna just like get out of the way here so that you can listen to our interview with Heidi. I'm Heidi. I'm Heidi. This is Heidi. Uh, I always struggle to not lead with like my career. Um, and, and that's like a really hard thing to do. I always want to say Heidi is a registered dietitian, um, which I am, but I am things before that. So Heidi is uh, an outdoor junkie and like mountain adventure enthusiast. Heidi is a dog mom to Sophie. Uh, Heidi is a lover of cooking for other people and board games and laughing 
and Heidi is also a registered sports dietitian and trail running is my like of all the things I could ever do it would be my my number one choice of adventure but I do enjoy doing everything outside so I think that covers it you did forget to mention that you like only drink iced coffee year round and (laughs) will make you any type of dessert that you could ever want on the face of this earth so important additions for everyone so ideally nitro cold brew but if that cannot be found I will drink just standard iced coffee even yes after a ski day or all the time yes I've witnessed this this is I wake up and take cold showers in the morning I'm just like a warm bodied person so yeah, I'm I'm wearing glasses. eight extra layers and uh-huh. Heidi's like <laughs> Heidi's Heidi. Yeah. Our, so I I run with Heidi. I run Heidi's dog. Um, we'll talk a little bit about maybe Heidi, the injury that you have been experiencing. Well, I'm gonna talk about you in third person this entire time. Heidi third. is injured. Awesome. Um, but Sophie and Heidi are one being in which they like need the shade and they are always warm. And then Pete and mm. I are one being in which Pete is currently sunbathing until she like is way overheated. And I am wearing pants huge socks. Like, okay. I am literally one mile from Heidi right now. Like that's how close we are in the city. And we look like we could be on completely different continents based on our layering schemes that are happening right now. I know this is an audio podcast, but this is, this is important, important filler for everyone. Corinne will come to my house and we'll have coffee in my backyard and I will be in a tank top and shorts and she will be in pants and a long sleeve shirt and a puppy vest and a parka and shoes and socks. Yeah. We'll probably do this tomorrow. It's going to be great. Yeah. Uh-huh. Anyway. Perfect. Yeah. Um, something that I've thought about a lot that I've asked people um, similarly when we've had them on is this kind of, I think that we have all gotten to the place we currently are in life due to the amalgamation of all of our life experiences, like the things that we are pursuing as our careers, as our what we fill so much of our days with, I think is due to this amalgamation of so much of our own personal experiences. And so I'm wondering, I know how passionate you are about your work. You're obviously passionate about the mountains and iced coffee as well, but can you tell us a little bit about how you've gotten to where you are now and how it is this combination of life events and interests? Mm, How much time do we have? (laughs) Uh, Yes, I, I would love to share. So I mean, growing up, I was a really avid athlete. I knew I wanted to have a career where I was working with athletes in some capacity, dabbled in the idea of doing physical therapy, uh, doing orthopedic surgery, and actually planned on studying physical therapy in college. It was kind of the direction I thought I wanted to go. And then the university I ended up going to where I got recruited to play soccer didn't have a PT program and just kind of like shifted my focus and was, you know, my advisor asked if I wanted to try nutrition and uh, took one class and I was sold. It was food chemistry and I'm a science nerd. So uh, I fell in love with the food science class. And so, and at that point it kind of just became a um, kind of that became my track. And I always knew that sports nutrition would be my focus. I dabbled in a variety of different areas of nutrition throughout undergrad and during my internship and even during the first couple of years of my career, but always came back to sports nutrition is that being really the place that I was most, most passionate. And so really worked on kind of funneling my career to be focused on sports nutrition. And so that's kind of like the professional, I mean, a little bit personal, but mostly like professional side of things. Personally, I think a lot of, so you know, I specialize in like endurance athletes, mountain athletes, female bodied athletes and the menstrual cycle, uh, plant-based athletes and athletes with eating disorders or disordered eating, uh, energy deficiency, et cetera. And like all of those, I feel I specialize in all of those areas because they all kind of sum up me. Like I'm not plant-based anymore, but I was for a lot of my, like, um, like running career. And So I specialize in those areas because I think there's a lot of value in having had the experience as a professional, you know, being able to speak to like trail runners and know that there is this gap between like research and practical application. And so being able to 
kind of put myself in their shoes and be empathetic in many regards. And so the areas I've chosen to focus in really come from the fact of I'm passionate about them because they really, uh, they're part of who I am and my journey. Uh, and then, and then, then that goes for like the disordered eating component too. So primarily my focus had been like sports nutrition from the standpoint of, you know, endurance athletes, trail runners, cyclists, et cetera, et cetera, uh, kind of discover the female, um, female physiology research as it pertains to nutrition in 20, end of 2017, early 2018, and was just pretty mind blown by that. So kind of specialized in that during my master's degree. Uh, and then it really wasn't until I can't be like, uh, made it more public that I'd struggled with an eating disorder that I decided to focus on eating disorders and disordered eating. Uh, it had been a part of my story for since definitely since college and probably a little bit earlier than that. And so, uh, but it was something that I either was in denial of or didn't want to admit or wasn't aware of, you know, any number of things. And then it really like reared its head, uh, kind of 20, 2018, 2019, and then decided to go to treatment in 2020. And so it was off the back end of treatment in 2020, where I decided that like, I really wanted to kind of pivot my practice into specializing in athletes with eating disorders. Yeah. And we'll touch more on kind of that personal, that personal journey into how you practice, um, as a dietitian, now, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience getting your master's degree over in England at Liverpool John Moores University. Um, we have we have some friends in common um, in the research in the re- research space, um, which is pretty pretty cool. But talk about going and pursuing your master's degree there and kind of how that has informed, particularly the sports nutrition space that you work within. Yeah, no, it was, I mean, it was an unbelievable experience. I, uh, you know, I wasn't set, necessarily set on going abroad, but once I started looking around, there weren't a lot of, there weren't a lot of like sports nutrition master's programs in the States. Um, and uh, I think there are a lot of benefits to going abroad. One being the programs are a year. It's like a really insane, intense year when you only do it in a year. But as someone who's already working and already had a job, like it was nice to be able to get it done in the air. So yeah, I applied there and got accepted. And so started fall of 2019 and finished up kind of the end of summer. Of, no, sorry. I started 2018 and ended in 2019. And it was, I mean, the caliber of research over in the UK is just unbelievable and I mean a lot of my professors were the most kind of well-researched well-known like sports scientists and sports nutrition you know professionals in the world you know the ones that have written all the the texts and done all the big research and so just to be able to learn under them was I mean an unbelievable experience I also my placement, I mentioned that I kind of specialized in female physiology. My placement was with Orco, which is the or- actually the company that puts out Fitter Women. Uh, so I was able to see Fitter Women kind of in its super early stages and help with some of that preliminary research and doing some of the recipe development for the app. And uh, it was just, yeah, the opportunities that I got over there were, yeah, were uh, just next level, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think it's cool. And I think it's a good thing to remember that there are those opportunities. You mentioned that you've been an athletic kid your whole life. I know that soccer was a big, a big part of that. And you went to college or were, were recruited to play soccer. And I'm like, yes, the Mia Ham generation. Um, but how did running then come into the picture, right? You go to college to play soccer, you become a collegiate runner and come into trail and ultra kind of after that standpoint. So how did running come into the picture for you? I mean, I think I was always, I was always like the weird kid on the team who liked fitness part of running. I was like the the one who didn't mind doing wind sprints. And it wasn't punishment. You're like, this is fun. Run laps. Uh, And so, but I really had never, I'd never really run. I mean, I, I remember 
one winter, probably my senior year of high school, like a teammate and I that I played club with running, I don't know, like two miles around our neighborhood uh, in the winter. But outside of the fitness we did in soccer, I never necessarily like ran. And then when I got to college, there were there was one girl on the team specifically, she was a year older than I was, who would run on off days. And I went to Seattle Pacific University and we would run from the university over to Gasworks Park and back. And I started just kind of really enjoy it. And so I kind of started doing longer and longer runs. And I think there was actually I did a podcast interview with an old college soccer team of mine a couple of weeks ago. And uh it, it, it's really interesting how even now, like conversations I have, I'm all of a sudden like, oh, actually, like that was kind of a, that was part of the development of, you know, my eating disorder or whatever. Like there's still things that I'm learning. Out, yeah. All the different things, yeah. Um, but I, um, I did start running like kind of compulsively as a means to control my body also. Uh, at that point, but, um, one or another, like, yeah, found running, loved it. And then, uh, just the coach and I did not see eye to eye. Uh, he was a phenomenal recruiter, but it wasn't a great experience for me. Um, once I got there and just didn't really jive with the soccer team. And so after my junior fall season, I ended up switching, uh, the coach and I just had a conversation and decided it was best for kind of me to leave the team which was hard. I had identified like soccer was like eat, breathe, sleep my whole life. I mean, I had, yeah, like Mia Hamm, Brandy Chastain, Michelle Lakers, like all over my room as a kid, but had, so he and I kind of made that decision. And because I had found running the several girls on the soccer team at the end of their senior career, they would join the track team and just do winter and spring track. And so I was always like, oh, like that would be something cool to do after I'm done with soccer. And so I just reached out to the coach, the long distance coach after uh, in my, my junior year, fall, my junior year. And she gave me the winter training plan. And I showed up in January and started training with the team. And yeah, it was kind of off to the races. And it was crazy how quickly I felt like I'd always been a runner and how different the environment was with running and how much more like at home, I felt having never really ran in my life. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was amazing also. And then also, I mean, as we're all aware, there was also a lot of toxic things that kind of went on. Uh, I think less, um, less blatant, a lot more kind of under the surface, kind of subtle things, but definitely a lot there that also really kind of fed my eating disorder. Unintended. Yeah, there's like a subliminal, there's a subliminal cultural type mm-hmm. of thing where it's not like anyone necessarily saying anything. It's the like, how do people eat when they're around each other? Like, what are those little, those little statements that get made? And now you work in a world where you're like unpacking this with athletes, I think all the time. So I'm sure it's kind of a constant, a kind a kind of a constant reminder or learning process in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been on this long kind of personal journey with disordered eating. You said recently, you're like, yeah, oh, I recognize kind of, you know, week to week of like, oh, actually the underpinnings track back this far or, oh, that I, I recognize now that that was part of my relationship with food or my body at this age where I didn't really realize that maybe, you know, a year ago or two years ago. And this kind of long journey culminated in you going to treatment in 2020. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about your experience and how you related to food and athletics and your body and recognizing that you needed more than, you know, that you needed help at that point. You're, you know, you're finishing a master's degree in dietetics yeah. and sports nutrition. Like it seems like kind of the the chicken and the egg and ending in this really interesting place of, of actually going to treatment in 2020. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, I had never really like food had never been an issue up until college. I, you know, grew up in the Weight Watchers era. I was Almond moms. Yeah. I was definitely aware of like bodies and which bodies were like more quote unquote more acceptable and more desired, whether that was, I mean, I was in soccer, so like less so there, but I think more was more accepted by like peers and society. Uh, and I I mean, one of the things I kind of learned at treatment was just like my 
very, very severe desire to like fit in. And that resulted in a lot of things in terms of like suppression of my sexuality and, and things like that. But so kind of was aware of like bodies and body ideals and remember like wanting to be smaller. Actually, I came across a crazy in, in middle school. I came across a like journal several years ago about my new year's. I think my new year's resolution was to lose weight, which is That's just a middle schooler insane. Cause like, I also, yeah, it just like, it's mind blowing to me. Um, but that never came necessarily came out through food. Uh, I even had a teammate in high school who had to go to inpatient treatment for eating disorder. Um, and I just remember being like, I love, like, I don't, I could never do that. Like I love food and I always have, like, I've always, you know, thoroughly enjoyed food. So, but then I got to college and I think there was this discussion on the soccer team about, you know, whether it's freshman 15 or needing to like stay in shape. And I just remember some of the upperclassmen talking about like making sure you like, you didn't gain weight as a freshman. And that's the first time that I actually remember being aware of calories and counting, counting them with the goal of eating less of them, like choosing things that were lower in calories. And so I think that's kind of when that started in terms of like calorie restriction and and I lost a lot of weight my freshman year especially just even that fall lost my period uh went home for the winter doctor put me on birth control because said that would get my period back which we all know is not the case. um she also said it would protect my bones which we all know is also not the case uh so was put on birth control and I just like kind of brushed it off. I think also, you know, I had a lot of people say, Oh, like you're so thin. Are you okay? And that's one of the reasons, like I I tell this a lot to people when I'm working with parents, coaches, support systems, athletes, whatever, anybody who's struggling with an eating disorder is like even commenting on a body out of concern saying, Oh, you look really thin. Like if someone's intentionally restricting and that's what they like, that's what they want, then that's just going to exacerbate. Yeah. You've confirmed it for them. Yeah. Right. So So yeah, I think kind of my eating kind of went under the rug for a while, despite people expressing concerns. And I got into the world of running and that like just changing in the type of activity from soccer to running, normal like changes in physiology that potentially can happen. Uh, And then kind of the normalization of, yeah, like ways of eating and, you know, the idea of like race weight, um, that kind of thing. And so it just, like it, it kind of ebbed and flowed over the course of like collegiate post collegiately, uh, sometimes it'd be better. Sometimes it'd be worse, but there was definitely always like some element of restriction on my end, um, being aware of, you know, calories, being aware of my weight. Um, and then, but again, like I was performing, like I was performing at a high level, whether it was in college or post collegiately, like I was like, I was a talented runner. I wasn't, you know, necessarily running any like top tier races, but I was generally always like winning or taking the podium. And I just, you know, it, it also kind of fueled that idea of like, well, this is just what it takes. Like I'm not doing anything wrong. And if I was, then I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing with my body. And so even though I kind of knew that I was maybe more aware of food than most people, I didn't really realize how severe it was. And then it really like kind of crashed when I went and got my master's degree. Uh, And I think it was, you know, being alone, it was the stress of school, whatever it was, but definitely became like a pretty severe eating disorder when I was over there. And then, you know, worsened once I got back. And then it was actually in January, 2020, I remember um, telling my ex-husband that, um, if, you know, I, I get myself so many days and I was needed to go to treatment if I like wasn't better. And I, then COVID happened. Uh, and so, I just, yep. Mm-hmm. And so I just kind of treated the lockdown as like my own residential treatment essentially, and kind of like got myself out of the really, really severe like behaviors. And then 
over the course of the next couple months kind of waxed and waned and then ultimately just realized that like even yeah even as a dietitian like I just knew I couldn't get myself to eat as much as I knew I needed to and knew that I had just a lot more under the surface that I really needed to yeah to like work on and uncover um and so yeah I called up uh, Opal Food and Body here in Seattle and went to treatment and yeah I was gonna say even coaches need coaches right it's like yeah. even though you know everything you're supposed to do it's like that doesn't give you a roadmap to undo your psychology yeah and I think that was like being I mean I think my education as a dietitian also really was problematic when it comes to like my eating disorder there are a lot of things I learned as a dietitian that really like enabled me to have an eating disorder when I was getting my undergraduate education it was all about like weight loss um, yeah that totally was- that time period like that's what that industry was really geared towards. Yeah. And then being a dietitian, like I had, I had so much shame for so much of my career about being, about having an eating disorder as a dietitian. And that was also really one of the things that kept me from treatment. Um, And it really wasn't until like, I just was so miserable. I also had a fibular stress fracture and went and got a bone density scan and uh, was told I pretty much was borderline osteoporotic. Like my um, scores were all like negative 2.3, negative 2.4. Um, and so kind of had a few like health things that were pretty big, like kind of shook me to my core. And I was just decided that I needed to, needed to. Yeah. I feel like I saw, I think you reshared this too, but from Kylie recently. And I think it was a quote that she was resharing of this idea of like, are you so like, what are you willing to do like to your health or to your yeah. injury risk that like is tied up in this idea of like gaining just a tiny bit of weight mm-hmm. yeah. in this like juxtaposition there. I think it's really interesting too this idea that like it took you so long to maybe get help because there was like a, there was shame associated with like, you work in this field, you should know better, yeah. like tisk tisk type yeah. of thing, which we see in other industries too, right? Yeah. We don't let, um, we saw pilots couldn't have a, any sort of like mental health issue or they get grounded and yeah. medical professionals, same sort of thing. Like we oftentimes don't treat them very well if they end up asking for help for addiction or for mental health um, issues, they get kind of like, it's like, why would you ever come forward with anything if you're going to get punished or feel like you're going to get punished? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So obviously mending is not linear, right? You know, this may be better than any of us. Um, although everyone in this, everyone in this little chat right now definitely understands that mending and taking care of our bodies are not linear. We've all had our varieties of a uh, big injury that's oftentimes related to low energy availability. And so I'm wondering like what for you has been the hardest part of this whole process of it not being linear, be it either professionally or personally, like, what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I think like, I feel, I don't know, like I feel super fortunate that like my recovery has been for the most part, pretty linear as it pertains to like food and eating disorder behaviors. Mm -hmm. Um, and why that is, I don't know. Um, I don't know being a dietitian helps, doesn't help. Um, I don't know if it, yeah. I mean, yeah, who knows? I do think, yeah, whether it's, you know, there was a lot wrapped up, whether it was, you know, my sexuality or whatever. But, uh, I also do think I had a friend ask me, I've had a lot of people ask me why isn't it really, they normally ask, well, isn't it really hard working with eating disorders being in recovery? Hmm. Like, doesn't it, isn't it harder for you? And I never really had a good answer. And then this past winter, I was talking to a friend and I think I just, I mean, what I phrase it as is like working with people with eating disorders doesn't, there's nothing that makes me want to have eating disorder less just because I see exposure therapy yeah, yeah, at its finest. Um, so, mm-hmm. so yeah, I feel like just very, very lucky because I know a lot of people can't say that but I think what's been really challenging for me has been the body stuff I think both like body image um for sure that's probably the biggest thing that has lingered is just like comfort in my body um versus like what my body was like during you know my different phases of disordered eating and so 
um, just like body image in general, but then also just like the, the, like the injury component. And I think body trust and how they're so interconnected and how, how the nonlinear healing of the physical body really makes body trust challenging. And so things like, you know, I've like, since treatment, I've had, I mean, including my first bone stress injury, I've had bone stress injury pretty much like once a year, the addition of other odds and ends of injuries. And like, I feel really grateful that my bone density has improved as much as it have. I'm like almost borderline normal now, which is for my age, like pretty, pretty crazy. We love that. And I'm like super grateful for that, but I like, and this is something that came up in the previous the interview I did with my teammate a couple of weeks ago, but like, you know, I work with so many high school athletes and so many college athletes who are struggling with bone stress injuries, um, you know, anywhere, you know, anywhere on kind of the, the red S spectrum, some intentional disordered eating, some unintentional. Um, but I, I think there is an element of like, I always, I still kind of look back and like wonder, like my body was like really fucking resilient. Um, it held up for a really long time. Yeah. Um, and I sometimes wish that it hadn't, um, just because I wonder like if I would have had a bone stress injury or maybe a bigger red flag earlier on, um, you know, how much of my life I could have gotten back, um, in a lot totally. of ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, since treatment, like it's really hard to say, cause I think like we, we have this expectation of, oh, well, like I'm going to eat enough. I'm going to get my period back. I'm going to like be intentional and recovery oriented about in all these different ways. And so I'm not going to get injured anymore. Mm -hmm. And like our bodies keep the score <laughs> in a lot yeah. of ways. And the idea, and I, I try to remind myself and I talk to my athletes about this idea of like, you know, for me now, like three years of eating enough and having a period is not going to undo 12 years of not. Um, and I think putting it in that kind of perspective is helpful. Uh, but it's really hard to like be so, cause I think the other thing with the eating disorders is like you, and it gets easier over time for sure, but it is one of those things where you kind of have to choose recovery, like all day. day, like, you know, I no longer, like, I don't do fasted, like I eat before every training, regardless of what time it is. Like I eat right, like, regard, you know, it's. And so I have these like safeguards for me that I am so, so, so intentional about that. I also know a lot of people aren't intentional about, and yet, you know, I still get injured. Um, and so I think like that nonlinear component is definitely been the hardest. And then what that does to body trust. Cause I think one of the things that so many people work on in eating disorder recovery is that idea of trusting your body. Uh, mm -hmm. and so that, that nonlinear physical recovery, whether it's hormonal, whether it's bone or like cardiovascular, you know, whatever it is, that nonlinear healing with the physical body makes that body trust really challenging. Um, yeah. Especially if your body, you, your body worked for you and didn't have these physical manifestations in your eating disorder. Why did you make it that much more? Yeah. I think anyone who's had a big injury or any injury can relate to that too. Of just like, yeah, it's really hard to trust yourself when you've had this time period off and you're like, trust yourself, trust your body that it's going to continue to work. I think it's interesting that, you know, early on when we asked about kind of like this amalgamation of experiences, um, you know, you, you touched on, you know, disordered eating, et cetera. Also just the endurance athlete space. You've mentioned that, you know, people ask you, isn't it really hard to work with people that are going through the same, the same issue? And I think it's really interesting and, and really very cool that you work with predominantly young athletes and a lot of young athletes that are struggling with low energy availability or red S and associated issues, um, that can come from disordered eating or can come from like just accidental, um, fueling issues. Um, I, and I love that, that, that is, that is the amalgamation of like your personal, your personal history, the work that you get to do. 
how, why is it so important to work with this group, this, these high schoolers, these college athletes, and then the associated, obviously like team around them, parents and coaches that can have such a big impact, but like, why is it so important for you to like hit that group of individuals? Yeah. You know, I think it's really because like the longer someone goes like believing something about their body or eating in a certain way, the harder it is to undo those habits. You know, I am working with like a couple adults also with eating disorders and like just the roots go deep. Um, and it is so, so like hard. Uh, you know, I use the analogy of like a, a car driving over a muddy road and just how deep those ruts get. And so when we think about like the neurological patterning uh, that years and years and years have, it makes it that much harder. And so in, I think there's also, I mean, social media also really doesn't help. It can be just the information access we have today and that high middle schoolers and high schoolers have today is helpful in some ways, but also pretty toxic. And so I think like being able to get in at a young age and give them the messaging that I needed to hear and didn't, uh, you know, be able to be that, you know, maybe one or one of a few positive voices in a crowd and in a sea of toxic culture, uh, regardless of what sport you're a part of or not an athlete at all, uh, being able to ideally, you know, nip it in the bud early on can make a really, really big impact and kind of set them up to like avoid a lot of things that I couldn't and didn't. And I think that's really where it comes from as I think about how much of my life my eating disorder took for me uh, and that I really wasn't aware of what I was losing until like the other side. And I think that's one of those things where you don't really realize how bad you had it until, or how bad things were or what you were missing out on or whatever, until you're on the other side of it. And so it really is just kind of that wanting to help young athletes kind of avoid, um, yeah, avoid kind of the, the long-term health repercussions as well as, you know, the relationships and like, there's just so much that an eating disorder can rob someone of. And so really wanting to help young athletes not have to kind of go down that path. Yeah. Get them, get them before they, they lose that, that time, that time to lay down bone, that time to perform or, or at least spare their performance longer term than that. Right. It's yeah. like yeah. the post-collegiate experience, et cetera, the adult, the adult sport experience, I think gets robbed in those moments as well. I think about that from like an overtraining perspective. Like I wish that I could distill that experience. Whenever I hear a young athlete talk about getting to that place, I'm like, Oh, I wish I had known, like, I could, like, could I have intervened in this person's, um, existence? Cause I've like, I was like, Ooh, everything you're saying sounds painfully familiar. Yeah. Um, we could walk this back. And, and I feel like, you know, you're a busy person. You're a very busy person. I feel like you're constantly either giving a talk or helping with a retreat or working at a camp or something of that nature. Um, doing really cool work actually most recently, like with faster with the really brilliant, um, Dr. Megan Roach and Emily and Dr. Emily Krause, um, which we, who we are very familiar with as well, giving a talk with them. So lots of overlaps, lots of all these like little yeah. connections, which I think are so cool. So tell us a little bit more specifically about the work that you do in that space, working with, you know, coaches, parents, athletes, kind of hitting it from all, all angles. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of have like two, I guess, two parts of my practice. And one is that kind of like working with athletes, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and, or their families, partners, parents, whatever it might be. And so, yeah, in that space, I do just like one-on-one -on -one work. My practice is virtual. So I work with athletes around the country and sometimes around the world, just doing one-on-one -on -one nutrition work. And again, that can be disorder eating disorders or just, you know, endurance athletes looking to like up their game, solve GI issues, whatever it might be. And also in that space, we'll work with say like partners or parents or families, um, if it is applicable. And then kind of the other side of it is more kind of the public speaking, presenting, like catering, cooking side of things, uh, which I mean, I love, I love the one-on-one -on -one work that I do, but there is something to me that's just like really one it's, I mean, I love presenting. I find it really energizing, but it's also this like crazy efficient way to get information 
out. And so I'm always like, man, if I speak to a room of 50 or hundred coaches for an hour, the number How of many athletes, athletes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it's just this like exponential gift that keeps on giving. So, I mean, that's definitely, I think one of my favorite parts of my job is public speaking, whether it's like zoom stuff. I have a lot of college programs who bring me on to present to a specific team or, you know, a whole athletic department via zoom or I work with tons of the local, like most local high schools in Seattle. I'll go in, you know, present, to, especially during cross country season. It's very busy. Uh, so I do a lot of like in-person presentations for, you know, local colleges and high schools, uh, you know, different sometimes like run clubs and things like that. And then camps, you know, retreats. So a couple of weeks ago, I went in and spoke at a uh, running, like kind of running and running and wellness retreat for physical therapists in Suncadia um trailhead learning collective put it on yes. uh and so they brought me in to like cook for them uh so i uh last year kind of started also incorporating like catering and cooking into some of like the camp retreat things which is super fun uh, i think it benefits them having like a sports dietitian cooking you know being able to integrate that like sports nutrition and nutrition for performance but also um kind of like into the culinary component and then be able to speak to like why we're eating what we're eating and then provide nutrition presentations off the back end of that. So I did something like that a couple weeks ago, have another camp on with the Island, um, uh, like a running camp for female bodied runners in June. So yeah, it's kind of like those two, those two areas. And I try and kind of maintain a, um, a little bit of a, a balance between, between the two and obviously have seasons of, you know, sometimes doing a lot more talks than, than others, but it keeps me it's fun I can't yeah. do I can't do the like the one thing same thing all the time I think we get that you're talking to a, a group of humans who are really bad at doing one thing it turns out um yeah. I do think that that immediately the gears were turning for me like well I know that you spoke you speak with coaches like just like just dawned on me like the exponential value of like talking to a room full of coaches particularly mm-hmm. on these issues um how dramatically impactful that can be when it comes to language and uh, comfort of talking about those things with their athletes, et cetera. Like, I think that we think of like, Oh, these aren't bad programs and they're not bad coaches. Oftentimes no, it's like no, subliminal messaging. These, Yeah. Ignorant ignorance yeah. is a, is a yeah. big factor. Um, or doctors too. Like I've done a couple like clinics and presentations for physicians, whether it's naturopathic physicians or like, uh, like MDs again, just because there's a lot of harm that happens in the medical system. Oh yeah. It's um, like here, step on the scale. Yeah. And yeah, just like, yeah, things that are said. And so just, um, that's also, I think a space where you can make a lot of like exciting impact in my mind. Yeah. Doing, doing the heavy lifting for all of us, I think with that, with that work, but I think it's, I think it's really valuable. The coaches and the parents, I think getting to those, and we have a lot of coaches and a lot of parents, um, who do listen to this podcast. I think that's really valuable information for them. And I guess speaking to the coaches and the parents, who are listening, um, like, what do you think are some of those most important takeaways when it comes to, I put, I think I wrote fueling twice, but also protecting like young athletes. Cause I think of it as like, once again, that ignorance component that like, what, what should be the take home message to yeah. parents of young athletes and coaches of young athletes that are listening? I think one of the biggest things is whether it's, I mean, one examining how you're talking about bodies, how you're talking about food, um, things like, are you saying again, a lot of times it's not malicious, but it's kind of the ignorant comments that are just very much cultural. So, you know, the idea of like earning, like earning a meal because you played well or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so kind of examining what are the things that you might be saying subconsciously about bodies in general or about food, even things like you look fit, like fitness doesn't have a look. Fitness is like a physiological manifestation. It is, there's no like one, there's no one fitness look. Uh, and so like examining the language that you're using and, and again, not even necessarily pertaining to like your child or your athletes, but even to like to yourself, to the general mm-hmm. public, um, like what kids mirror it, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. And so I think the other component of, is the idea of actions speak louder than words. And I don't necessarily say like speak louder, but actions speak just as loud as words. Like there are so many examples that I have, whether it's like in my own eating disorder or with the athletes that I work with, where nobody said anything to them, but they mirrored actions of coaches, of parents, 
because those are the people who either like the athlete looks up to, or is really kind of giving the athlete like the experience and essence of like what it is to exist as a person in this world, as a runner, like, and so also just checking yourself and like, what is your relationship with your body? And what is your relationship with food? Like, how do you eat around your athletes? Do you eat around your athletes? Um, are you talking about like your body or needing to, you know, lose weight, things like that. And I think those, like those two things in and of itself can be incredibly, like incredibly powerful, um, without even getting into some of like the more malicious or like, like whether it's things like weighing athletes or like talking about race weight or those things that are kind of more blatant. Like, I think you've been taking a step back and saying, okay, like, how are you, how are you talking about food and bodies and what is your own relationship with like food and bodies and how could those actions be setting up a not great example? Yeah. I think there's a lot of unintentional harm that gets done. I remember talking to Maria Dalza and she remembers she was talking about someone on an, in, like on a podcast asking her like in a rapid, like a rapid fire question, like, Oh, what's your favorite post run treat? And she's like, treat is a reward. Like I don't need a reward. Like food is not a reward. Food is like food is food and food is so much more than just food is food. But it was like, you know, I was like, I love that she like, like stuck to her like conviction over like this idea that she's like, wait, no, like it's not a, it's not a treat. Like it's, it's food. It's like what I want to go eat and ingest. So I was like, yeah, people examining it, I think is a big a big deal. And I've thought critically about a lot of it, having been a coach of young athletes Mm -hmm. in the past, trying to be really cognizant of what am I mirroring? What am I showing? What am I doing day in and day out that these kids totally, they, they absorb it all, even if they don't know they're absorbing it. And I think everyone listening probably can think back to a moment where someone said something to them or to a friend or to a sibling or to themselves, you know, I had teammates growing up whose moms definitely struggled with various issues yeah. and were super self-critical of their own looks, et cetera. And their, their kids a hundred percent absorbed that. So, yeah. yeah. Um, or even, yeah, having like a food forward environment or culture, whether that's like as a coach, you know, if financially it's in the cards for you have a snack box, that athletes can, you know, utilize before and after practice. Uh, and just kind of, again, establishing that culture of, okay, we eat before and after, um, whether that's high school or collegiate, you can have it look a lot of different ways uh, in terms of, again, like what makes sense for the program financially. And then as parents, I think, you know, are you like, do you have things that are off limits and, you know, are you like restricting, are you you closing the kitchen? Um, are you restricting, you know, nighttime snacks to just be like healthy food, whether it's like, you can only have like yeah whatever it might be um yeah Yeah. um and so yeah also kind of just examining like is there kind of that you know food forward or like food freedom essentially um at home or on the team yeah super super important what do you think is the most important thing I mean it's hard to probably choose one right they're like there's 800 things that we should list right now what do you think though for a young athlete like if they're maybe they're struggling or not struggling. What, what, what do you think is the most important kind of take home message for, for them? I think putting you on the spot. Yeah, this is the one, this is a hard one to choose. Uh, I think, I mean, a couple of quick things. One, like there is no, regardless of like what you might see and it's very hard to believe, like there is no athlete's body within each individual sport or otherwise. And I think, I think I remind athletes that every single person on this planet has a different DNA. And so to expect that every person on the planet is going to look the same or that all the runners on a team are going to look the same is unrealistic. Uh, And your body will truly perform its best when it is like fueled adequately. And when you're getting enough sleep and when you're doing your due diligence to train, but also recover And so I think it's that idea of, yeah, like if you can just stay in your lane and know what you need to do for on like from that component, um, trying to 
restrict your body or like trying to force your body into something that forces restriction. Like if the only way you're going to get to X number of pounds or to look like a teammate is by restricting your food, then your body is not going to perform at its highest level at that, like at that point. Um, there might be some like short-term performance increases that can come from a variety of places, whether it's brain chemistry and endorphins or otherwise. But again, also remembering that that's also not a, it's not a long-term or sustainable pattern um, and can cause a lot more like harm on the term consequences. But, yeah. Uh, no, we're not fear mongering, but. But it's, it's a, it's reality. Check. Reality. Um, you know, most athletes aren't, I mean, very few athletes are thinking long-term, you know, when they, when we have discussion and a lot of them are like, oh, well, like, I don't care about my, you know, reproduction or I don't know if I want to have kids. Like it's way more than just like protecting mm-hmm. kids to have kids. Right. Um, it is cardiovascular. It is bone. It is also just well being. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, eating disorders are also like most deadly mental health disease that exists. So it's like, uh, there's not a lot, um, there's just not a lot of that like long-term foresight when we're kind of in that place of um, wanting to perform at the highest level or just like look better yeah. in quotes. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably the, the um, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things. Yeah. And I think kind of building off of that, like reflecting back to like the beginning of your career as a registered dietitian, but also like, and maybe these are, maybe there's two different answers here, but reflecting back to like the beginning of your career. And then again, like also reflecting on your own athletics, like what do you know now that you wish you knew then? I mean, having a, you know, time machine to be able to see what I was doing to my body. Like, I mean, that would have been beneficial, but if like something realistic would be, you know, I think, like I said, I, you know, I lost my period and that was like, quote unquote, like, you know, a badge of honor. And I felt like, oh, you know, I have to eat this way to perform well. I think now, I mean, one of the things that I work on with my athletes a lot is like, we know that periods are ergogenic. Like we know that they are performance enhancing for a lot of different reasons and like healthy menstrual cycles uh, and also eating is aerogenic. Um, and so it's just like the question of, yes, you're performing well now, but how much better could you be if you actually had a menstrual cycle and if you were eating enough for your sport? Uh, and yeah. I think that is probably the biggest, like, I think if I would have, if someone would have like posed those questions early on, and like gave me that education and information around like why menstrual cycle is, is going to help performance. Like if we're just looking at the performance and not long-term health components. Like if I'm just looking at performance. Like if I would have gotten that education and, you know, had someone say like, what is the harm in eating more? Like, what is the harm going to be in, you know, going into a training session adequately fueled? Um, what are you going to lose by trying this out? Like, like what, you know, it, you might as well see if it works. Um, and so I think like those two things would have been incredibly like, yeah, I think helpful. Um, and then also, yeah, I like doctors and like the medical system as a whole, like finding, I guess, finding medical professionals that specialize in people like you would maybe be just like another piece of advice. Um, Keely's working on that right now. Yeah. Whether that's <laughs> physicians or dietitians or mental health specialists or like whatever, co- like coaches, whatever it is, but finding, having a medical team that will like see you as a person and not as a number. Um, yeah. And like, no can, yeah. Put dots together and like call you out on your bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you said that, that menstruation is an ergogenic aid and being adequately fueled is an ergogenic aid. Cause I think when we think of ergogenic aids, we think of like caffeine and steroids and like things that are both illicit and not illicit, obviously, but I love that. It's like, yeah, no menstruating yeah, is ergogenic. ergogenic aid is like something performance that enhancing. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's, we should make t-shirts that say that food, menstruation. food is my ergogenic aid of choice. Yeah. My period, I have menstruation is doping. Yeah. <laughs> One of my clients made me a tank top that says my period is my superpower. 
I love it. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's mind blowing, which is a whole other topic in itself. Heidi, I know you were talking about this a little bit and I wonder if you could uh, expand on it slightly. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about how, when you're in it, you don't really know what the other side feels like. Mm-hmm. I can relate 100%. I'm sure everyone listening or a lot of people listening can also relate. You know, it's, it's easy to look back and be like, holy cow, how did I live that way? But when you're in it, you don't really realize that. And so how do you articulate that to clients that might be really deep in the weeds? Um, how do you find like you can get that across to them or, or is it, or is it not possible right now? Um, you know, it's, I think it is a little bit dependent on the person and like where they are and like the level of like acceptance, readiness, you know, that kind of thing. But I do, I mean, I, like I am very like open and candid and honest and share a lot of my like personal journey and my practice. Cause I think it's really powerful. You know, it's something as a dietitian, we were always told to not self-disclose. Um, and I think like that that's why my practice has kind of like exploded the way it has in the past couple of years is because I like disclose a lot. Uh, and so I think in those, like in that vein, I try and share or like specific examples of like my experience prior and then post um, kind of as it pertains to that, you know, when you're in it, you don't realize it. And I think one specific example is, you know, I got in the habit of just like running fasted, you know, I would generally just like not eat before training in the morning. And it just like kind of just became what I did, whether I was hungry or not. Like, I think initially it was accidental and then it became, you know, an intentional form of restriction, but I went after treatment and when I started running again, I still remember like my parents were in town a couple months after I had gotten out and they were staying at the house and I'd gone out for a run and it was probably one of the first like decent runs I'd done. And I ate before And I just remember being on the run and being like, oh my God, this feels good. Like I was just blown away at like how much, how much better I felt and what it actually felt like to like have an engine and like be running up a hill and like feel like, like I was powering myself up the hill. Uh, And then the recovery aspect too, to not just be like wrecked the whole day after a run or be like super sore. So, yeah, I think it is a lot of those things. Like I just, yeah, like when you're in it, it's hard to see otherwise, especially if things aren't going wrong and it's easy to brush it off as like, I'm not sick enough because like, I'm not experiencing X, Y, Z. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So it's, it's a hard question question like to ask or to answer directly but I do try and share like anecdotes like that um whether it's performance related or yeah like relationship you know relationship or just like brain space I didn't even realize again to like after treatment like how much of my day and brain space was like wasted thinking about food and just like how exhausted I would be by the end of the day just like that preoccupation and so mm-hmm. just the free brain space um and like that is also something that I think is like not necessarily not like talked about as much so mm-hmm. yeah I think it's a little bit dependent on the person and that kind of thing but um yeah I don't know mm-hmm. that makes sense yeah I know I think you know one way to do that is to build their trust. And by being open, I'm sure you've been able to build the trust of a lot of your clients because that's probably the only way in, in the beginning is to make sure they trust you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And re- re- be like, it's like, Oh, it's relatable. Like yeah. I, it's like, I, I joke, I joke. Yeah. I joke that I like, I collected athletes that have the same problems as me. Yeah. Cause it's like, they're like, Oh, well, you understand how to do yeah. this or come back from that. Or 100%. I'm like, Oh, we're like the little like Island of broken toys or whatever it is. Yeah. It's great. Um, yeah. No, there is something powerful in being able to share a lived experience. 
I think the only other thing I have on my end, Heidi, is can you tell people where they can find you if they're interested in learning more about what you do or yeah. reaching out to you, obviously in all your abundant free time to speak with their with their athletes or their coaches group, et cetera? Um, so I am in the process of building my website. Um, it's been on the back burner since I started my business, but I've committed to it. To doing it in the next couple of months. So uh, while I'm in the process of building out my website, the best way to get get a hold of me is Instagram. Um, unfortunately, I'm not cool enough to be on TikTok. Um, I Instagram is the only it's like social platform that I'm on, just from a brain space standpoint. So, uh, yeah, Instagram uh, HK Strickler underscore Sports RD. Um, I'm sure you'll kind of link it in the show notes. Oh, um, we will. Instagram is the best way. Message me there. Uh, you can also send me an email, but Instagram is probably like the most accessible. Um, and then we can email or whatever it is. Okay. I said I was biased, but I do truly love every conversation I have with Heidi. I hope that you were able to take something from that, Keely, as you kind of sat in there and got to listen to her talk what really stood out to you as far as her story or the work she does at this point with, with, with young athletes in particular? I think Heidi brings a really unique perspective to the field of sports nutrition because she is so intimately involved in the eating disorder world with having a very traumatic one. Um, and, you know, one of the quotes she said during the interview was that she gets really frustrated because three years of recovery doesn't always outweigh 12 years of abuse. And she feels frustrated around this when she has like an injury flare up, even though she's fueling really well and treating her body with respect. And, and this just resonated a lot with me because I do think that as you pull yourself out of the weeds and you start fueling well, you start recovering well and training properly, but you find yourself sidelined by injury that feels a little bit more like something that should have happened to you 10 years ago when you were really destroying yourself, it can be really frustrating and it can really derail you from your journey because it all of a sudden feels like, well, why am I doing this? You know, I, I used to not get this injured. And now, you know, after actually recovering and trying to be really, really healthy, I still find these injuries. And I just thought that she, her talking about that is really really eye-opening and really great for other people to hear. And I can only imagine that is why she is such a stellar sports dietitian because she actually, you know, says these things that are really relatable to her clients and makes them feel like they're not alone and acknowledges that this journey can be really, really frustrating. Yeah. Nor- normalizes it, right? Is like, mm-hmm. I've been there. I've literally been where you are. I am where you are right now, et cetera. And I think that she talked a little bit about feeling a lot of shame about that initially of like needing to go to treatment. And she's like, I'm a dietitian. How, like, how am I, how do I need to, why do I need to go to treatment? And it's like, I think that that shame is really real and really understandable and super relatable, but it's also like that, that experience, her life experience and her life journey up into this point, up into treatment. And then after treatment is like, what makes her such an amazing dietitian and the coaches that get to work with her and hear from her and the parents and the athletes, I think are just really, really lucky. Again, we'll tag, um, we'll link to her Instagram page in our show notes. And we'll also tag her on our social media account when we post about this, where you're seeing it right now. Yeah. And hopefully in like a couple of years, we can have better discussions around like how we actually can come out of something like an eating disorder and how long it actually takes for the body to recover and all of these things. Because one thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning of this talk was that at ACSM last night, I was at the female and male athlete triad coalition meeting um, with uh, Dr. Mary Jane D'Souza out of Penn State, who is like the goat so in this good. field. <laughs> I've read so many and, papers with oh their God, name on right? it. And um, she actually was talking about current studies they have undergoing where they're actually looking at the refeeding process. That's what they're calling it, where they're actually taking people who were in this long-term energy deficit state and refeeding them and seeing like how long it takes for certain physiological parameters to recover. And so there is work being done. Um, you know, it's probably a couple of years out, but it's really cool to know that there are really stellar scientists um, working hard on this topic too. Yeah. So cool. And so, so very important. So thank you, Heidi. And thank you to all the scientists out there. Heidi will be at the female athlete symposium meeting, which will happen after this comes out. So if you are going to that conference out in Boston, Boston. 
out in Boston, look for Heidi Strickler out there. She'll be, she'll be out there attending and learning and growing at that process through that process too. So that brings us to the final thing for today. That is Society Slam brought to you by our friends. We've got a lot of friends, it turns out, over at Petzl. Um, Steven stole my Petzl again and took it on a on a ski last week. And he's like, Corinne, this new Petzl headlamp, the Petzl Now RL, is the best headlamp I've ever owned. And I was like, well, you don't own it. It's my headlamp. And he said, well, I married you. So what's yours is mine. So if you don't personally own the Petzl <laughs> Now RL, but you have a significant other who does, I'm telling you, I'm giving you permission to lay claim to that headlamp because it's pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. And then make them go buy another one. Easy. That's so, that's so <laughs> chill. Go buy two Petzl Now RLs. Um, Healy, <laughs> you mentioned that you have some really great society slams for us this week. And I'm wondering if you can mm-hmm. tell me what they are. Yeah, I have more of a question-based society slam this week. So we have some some ladies asking for some advice. And so I thought I would make today's theme kind of advice theme. And so we have, we're dear sugar, dear sugar meets trail society. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) All right. So we have our girl, Julie, and she is asking for advice on tackling the Leadville marathon. She wants, was wondering if we had any advice on clothing, because it looks like there will be quite a bit of snow on mosquito pass running strategies with poles or no poles. And, um, what about running on hills that are going to be snowy versus no snow? This is a great question. I think that that course does not necessitate poles for the most part. It's, it's at, it's at altitude, but it's not exactly a super hilly course, um, akin to the Leadville, um, silver rush 50 mile and the Leadville 100 trail run. Um, it's obviously very high elevation, but it's not, there's not a lot of long climbing where I would be bringing poles for, um, for snow and for temperature, even though there might be snow in the course, it might not be that cold and you're going to have a lot of solar radiation or solar heat from the sun. So actually the thing that I would do is make sure that you have sunglasses, um, for your eyeballs because snow is very bright. Um, so bring your sunglasses and then I would potentially consider wearing something like a sun shirt, um, in races like that, where, it's higher altitude. So it's a little bit cooler, but it can still feel really warm from the sun. Um, just like shielding your skin can go a long way. Mm -hmm. So a sun shirt or a really lightweight long sleeve, um, a hat and sunglasses for glare off the snow surfaces. In my mind, those are the big things when it comes to running and recreating in the snow in the spring and summertime is the, is the, it's not really the snow. It's the sun off the snow that I am most concerned Mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something I'm going to do for States, which is silly, but I think is also, you know, pertinent is, um, go run on some snow, mm-hmm. just like even if it's practice, a couple of times, a yeah, just a little bit of practice goes a long way. Or so if this you're person like, lives near sand and not snow yeah, running, running on the sand a little bit. It's very, it's, it's super similar in my mind. It's like uh-huh. a little bit, the surface has more give than you're used to. And it's a little bit off camber. Yeah. Um, but not, don't do too Almost much of your energy. Yeah. Don't do too much Mm -hmm. of it in my mind, because Mm -hmm. I think you're at higher risk for injury and for stabilizer issues. And just it, it, it's cost, it's costly from an energy Mm -hmm. standpoint. And that I think speaks to the last part of her question about, um, how to approach running on Mm -hmm. snow, um, Mm -hmm. particularly climbing Mm -hmm. on snow. And it's don't, don't panic about pace or having to run a certain speed on it. It's, it's not, it's not an efficient surface to run on. It's really awkward. It's off camber. It can be slippery. Um, so for uphills, I I'm patient. I try to relax. I try to slow down because actually I feel like if you slow down and relax, you move faster instead of trying to fight it. It's more like, um, running man motion than actually running at that point. (laughs) And then I think that that goes a long way for like feeling like you're slipping around in it more than anything. And then downhill snow, I love, cause you just kind of get to run and slide and foot mm-hmm. like boot ski foot ski a little bit. And that I think can be honestly an enjoyable experience from there. Yeah, absolutely. Just be patient. I think, you know, trying to run something that maybe you'd normally run, but it's covered in snow, just take it a little easier. You're not yeah. going to lose any time. Hike Everyone's it. going through it. Nobody's going to be sprinting through the snow. And so, yeah, take some of your, if you have time goals, just like give yourself a little bit bigger of a range because that's just snows a little bit harder. And then the final question she had 
was around um, fueling for something that's at that high of altitude. Um, and yeah, I mean, my first thing is, is my experience with Amanda. I ran Trans Rockies uh, in 2017 and 2018, I believe, with Amanda Basham, who lived in Colorado at the time. And the first day, my first year, before I was well well informed about fueling, uh, I did not eat really hardly at all, at all, maybe one gel an hour. And I bonked like crazy. Don't bonk so Because it was at altitude fast. and I didn't fuel. And so I looked at Amanda and I'm like, she's like, what did you eat? And I was like, probably like a gel an hour. She goes, no, you need four. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to go as far as to say four, but like if you're used to eating two to three an hour, go towards the three to four an hour, like definitely increase those calories because you are working harder running at those higher elevations. Your body's burning more fuel. My dog is now dreaming in the background. So PD says, yes, I agree to that. And the other thing I would say is that akin to running in the heat or racing in the heat, um, your body's ability to digest calories goes down. You need the calories. You need more calories at altitude, but your blood supply akin when you're hot, right? Blood goes to your skin surface because you're really warm. It's trying to cool you down at altitude. Your blood is needed elsewhere. You need oxygenated blood in your muscles, et cetera, in your brain. And so you also have a shunting of blood away from your, like your stomach tissue, like your intestines. Um, and so if you find that you struggle to consume more traditional calories at altitude or in the heat, um, going to a liquid calorie um, can be a really good option there because it's just much easier to digest it. Super simple, goes down really easily. Um, my mouth is really dry at elevation sometimes. So mm -hmm. I just find oh that gosh, like totally. liquid calories for parts of it can be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'd mix and match. I I, I think yeah. that you can get for a trail marathon in particular, I think you can get away with um, we're being a little bit more reliant on those liquid calories too. So that might be an easy way to get some more calories in without, mm -hmm. um, risking GI upset. Yeah. Yeah. And just be flexible with your plan. If you feel like you're thirsty and you're not getting enough drink, like just drink more. Um, awesome. Good luck to you at Wedville. That's exciting. All right. Last question. And we'll wrap up for the day. Um, we have a master's student out of Canada who's asking Sick. for advice for her upcoming defense. <gasps> And just we how to deal with the pressure. We We're are, but I feel like we could give a little bit of insight into dealing with like pressure and interrogation and that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, okay. So here's the thing. The goal of a defense is for them to get you to eventually say, I don't know, which is okay. Like they're going to like when, like you're obviously you're defending your own, like you're presenting your research. If it's like a traditional master's thesis or PhD thesis defense, right? Like you're presenting your research and then they can ask you questions, questions about your research or questions about your research topic. Since she's a Canadian master's student, this seems like it's probably pretty similar to the pro like the program I went through. The goal eventually is to ask you a question where you might not know the answer. Like they're testing your knowledge base range and scope for the field you studied. And in my mind, you can't be afraid of that. Like you can't be afraid of like getting to a point where you don't, because you do know, you do, you know, a lot, like you are a mini expert in what you've studied and the associated topics that went into that, like gnarly lit review you did and to the pieces of research that you had to do, et cetera. Um, and so I think like that can feel really scary. And I know plenty of people who hate saying they don't know, but I think it can be really rewarding to be like, to become more comfortable being like, that's a really great question. I don't know the answer, but like, you know, maybe like this is how I'd approach that question or how I'd approach that thing. So I think that that can be actually a really rewarding experience and comforting thing to be like, okay, eventually I'm not going to know the answer. And that, that is okay. Like that is the goal of the defense. Yeah. And I think sometimes too, it's, it's, they want to know how you're thinking and how you're using all of your new knowledge that you learned to problem solve. And so sometimes you might not know the right answer, but you might have all of this knowledge in really relatable areas that you can almost piece together a really strong answer with. Yeah. You might good. not directly answer their question, but it's, yeah. it's a way of thinking that is, that is, you know, proposing an answer based off the research you've done. You're getting credit for showing your work, right? It's like the best chemistry teacher I had in undergrad we didn't get points for getting the right answer. He had 10 questions and we had 10 sheets of paper to answer his 10 questions. We got, we st all started with zero points and we got points given back to us for showing our work and like working through the problem. So even if you got the wrong answer, 
you didn't get zero points for that. You might've gotten nine out of 10 points for that question even, or eight out of 10 points for that question. Like the points weren't from getting the right answer. It was from Mm -hmm. showing your work. And that's kind of what you just said. It's like, Mm -hmm. they want you to show your work. They want you to talk about what you know in reference to what they've asked. And I think that like, we all struggle with imposter syndrome independent of how skilled we are, how many acronyms we have after our names, how many, if you're me, how many partial acronyms you have after your name. Um, Turns out 60% of a PhD does not get you very far. But I will say that like, you know, a lot, it's normal to have imposter syndrome and just like go in there, like, like knowing that you're there, it's like a celebration. It's not, it's not a test. They're not going to fail you. They want you to succeed. Like a, a, a thesis defense is not like pass fail. We're trying to trip you up. It's like a celebration of the work you've done um, akin to an ultra, right? Like mm-hmm. it's not, it's not pass fail at an ultra. It's a mm-hmm. celebration of the work and the training that you've done to get to that point. And honestly, a thesis defense should be the same thing. It should be a celebration. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love that analogy. <laughs> so shout out to Miranda. Good luck. End of yeah. June. You got let this. Us, let us know how it goes. Also, let us read your master's thesis. It sounds <laughs> cool. We don't know what it's in. It's probably <laughs> we have no clue what it's in. It but might be. <laughs> yeah, it might be about like. I love learning a specific stuff. type of frog that sleeps a lot or something. I don't know what it's on, but Sounds please to me. send it our way. We want all <laughs> your master's theses. Okay. Enough of that for today. Thank you so much for joining us and listening to all of our rants and rambles. We hope you enjoyed our interview with Heidi Strickler and we can't wait to share what is coming next. Until next time, we'll see you on the trails.